who are uh, streaming in this morning. I want to make a note to you, as well as to those who are here. Last week, you probably saw when it came to our class notes, it said Reverend Coho's notes. But it turns out that if you click on that and you see the stuff, you have no way to print it out unless you're using the church app. So if you're using a church app, that will get you what you need. We've corrected it so that this week, beside Reverend Coho's notes, you will see printable schedule or printable notes. You want to click on that because that's what's going to bring up your little icon where you can print the pages. For today, you will have a map and two half sheets that you want to print out. On our handout today, that two half sheets is back to back, but you want to print it out anyway because you're going to take all these voluminous notes, I'm sure. So for all of you and you who are streaming, if you need to print those notes out now, go do it because the rest of us are going to share with one another the verse that we learned from 1 Peter chapter 1 last week. So let's take a few moments here, turn to somebody else, give them your card, and we will recite the verse we learned this week from 1 Peter chapter 1. All right, let's do that while they are printing out their notes. Did you do a verse last week, ma'am? You weren't here. Well, in this case, let me just give you my card, and I'll, I'll do mine for you. Okay. <laughs> From the long family of Garbers. <laughs> First Peter 1, 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. 1 Peter 1, 3, and 4. Okay. Well, thank you. All right. Remember, each week we're going to do that. If you didn't pick up your index card today, pick it up. Take your index card, and we'll have a verse from 1 Peter 2. After you read through the chapter and something that God strikes you with and you say, that's really terrific. It was probably hard this week. There's so many great verses in 1 Peter 1, you could keep on keeping on. And I didn't cheat this week. Last week I recited one for you, but I added to it. And she said I was perfect. It's hard to be humble when you're perfect, but anyway, I'll try to be humble. And for you who are streaming in, I want to invite you also, you'll have to get your own 3x5 card, but to write out a verse from 1 Peter 2 as you are reading again in the coming week. The importance is to keep God's Word hid in your heart because God's Word will keep you from sin or else sin will keep you from God's Word. So next week, don't slug off. You're going to have two verses next week that you will share from 1 Peter 1, 1 Peter 2. Oh, some, I hear the groans mentally, but it's all right. You can do it. You can do it. You'll see. All right. This morning, I want to start off. I was going to go a different course, but I think uh, before we do our lesson, I said that anybody that had a concern about today's chapter, is there anybody that has a question or a comment for today's chapter? You want to be sure that something is covered? Ah, oh, we have many diligent scholars down here, so there's no need. Okay, I see nothing. As we move through this, I would like, as we come to the world of Peter and Jude, before we get to the map, I wanted to point something out as we get to 1 Peter. Anybody that reads the commentary will say, well, maybe Peter didn't do this, because when you read this, compared to his preaching back in Acts, or his short comments in the Gospels, this is really fine Greek. It really is. It's great reading in Greek. So unless you belong to one of these Greek sub-shops, you'll probably have nobody to share this with. But the fact is that it's so different. And I can't help saying that if you notice, as we're going along with Ephesians, 
You're going to notice all the themes that Pastor Walker's been bringing up already has come up in 1 Peter 1 as far as Ephesians 1 and in parts of later Romans, some of Paul's letters, but I have a reason for you to know that. But first, I want you to think about this. If you ask most of us, tell me when God was great. You say, most of all, you know, all in the Bible, he did this. He did miracles in the Old Testament. He did healings through Jesus in the New. And then we get to the back work of the Holy Spirit through the actions of the apostles. What happens when you get to chapter 28? I think a lot of us have the idea that, you know, God was probably pooped out by that time and he just said, look, I'm going to leave it to you people in the human race to get this thing done. Right? Or at least the idea that all that we can know about Jesus and the truth of Scripture ended at Acts 28. I want to show you, because we often forget, how do you know the Bible you're reading and the text that we get our translations from are the real deal? and not just stuff that was pulled together. The Apostle John lived until the year 96 or 95 AD. But in his lifetime, he tutored a guy named Polycarp. That doesn't mean many fishes. It just Polycarp was the name. And the reading of Polycarp and his execution at the age of 86, I can never read this aloud to crowds without breaking into tears. So it's, I always read it quietly to myself. Polycarp was a disciple of John the Apostle, the last of the Jesus Apostles, and all that he had, he learned from him. He had a disciple named Irenaeus, Irenaeus, who became, by the way, Polycarp was the bishop of Smyrna, which was one of the churches in Revelation that you will read about, big, wealthy, and a sinful city. And then Irenaeus became, as a disciple, say a grandson of John's in spiritual matters, he became the bishop of Lyon in Gaul, France. Lyons, as some people say, the same people that talk about Amish, okay? During this time, Polycarp lived till he was 155 when he was executed. And another man named Clement, there are two Clements in church history writing. This one was Clement of Rome. He was right there in the early days of the apostles when Peter and Paul were in Rome. I'll read something from him in a moment. Also, Eusebius of Caesarea, which is there in you see, sorry for a mess, CBS of Caesarea was the historian of the church, and from his birth and time until 339, he wrote a history of the apostolic and early church after the death of the apostles. So you have this long line of people who are testifying to the reality of apostolic scripture. We know, as we have said and as we heard this morning, or you will hear when you hear Pastor Walker in the second service, that the apostolic base, the foundation of Jesus Christ and the apostles, was indeed assured because of a long line of people who were disciples of disciples or witnesses. Clement of Rome was in here around 115. Now, the year 336 or 335 is when Constantine, one of the emperors of Rome, became a Christian and dropped the outlawing of Christianity so that Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. So you'll have a place where you can see right down to that time. And then since at that point, Christianity was free from being attacked uh, or spied upon, you have more writings that come out. There are books that carry these documents, and I want to read for you four short excerpts, just so you have an understanding. This one is from Irenaeus, the bishop of Gaul, or France at the time, when he wrote this, and they were talking about the testimony of scriptures. He spoke in the following, Matthew published his gospel among the Hebrews, that is the Jews, in their own language, when Peter 
and Paul were preaching the gospel in Rome and founding the church there. That might get your ears. You say, well, wait, didn't Paul write a letter to the Romans? Yes, those Romans were Jewish Christians who had been some exiled like Priscilla and Aquila out of Rome and others who had gotten back in. And Paul's letter to the Romans is not an established church, but the band of the Jewish Christians who were there. When Paul usually speaks to churches, he's talking about both Jews and Gentiles who are in that congregation. And it's interesting that Irenaeus talks about Peter and Paul in Rome together. And this is why I believe as we read First and Second Peter, you're going to say, wow, this sounds a lot like what Pastor Walker's dealing with in Ephesians or what I've read in Romans, or where I've seen some of these comments also say in the letters of Paul. The fact is that if Peter and Paul together were establishing and founding the church in Rome, there came a solid congregation. And of course, as we get to our last lectures in this series, which will be on the Roman church, the papacy of Peter and so on, at least in the uh, Universal Roman Catholic Church, this is the basis on which Peter was the first pope. But we will see perhaps other things. And so it went on. Now I want to read also to you from a thing called the Muratorian Canon. C-A-N-O-N. When we talk about the canon of scripture, this is from the Latin. It means a rule or a measurement. This is not a big military gun. That's two ends. Okay? A canon or the rule, the measurement of scripture, or the canon of faith that the Bible talks about. They're talking about what makes a real Christian or what's real scripture. The Muratorian canon came up, it was the second century, that is the years 100 to 200, a second century document outlining what at that point the early church saw as the true scriptures. So I'm just going to dig in here where it speaks about this. The third book of the gospel is that of Luke. Luke, the physician who after the ascension of Christ, Paul had taken with him as one, the, the word could mean a student of journalism or uh, a traveling companion, but he was the one documenting what was going on in the apostolic church. We know this from the book of Acts. And... Also, he made it clear he had not seen the Lord in the flesh, but he set down events as far as he could ascertain them and began his story with the birth of John the baptizer and with the word of many witnesses. Moreover, the Acts of the Apostles are included in one book. Luke addressed them to the most excellent Theophilus because the several events took place when he was present. We know this because often in a book of uh, uh, the Acts of the Apostles, particularly after chapter 13, it will also say, and we went and we did, and Luke is talking about his companionship with Paul. But notice what he says here also. He makes plain that he was there when the events were present, and he makes it also plain by the omission of the suffering of Peter, and the journey of Paul to Rome, from Rome to Spain. If you know in the last two chapters of the book of Romans, the letter to the Romans, he's saying, hey, I'm going to come to you hoping I'll have a blessing being with you and you from me, but also you might help me on my way. I want to go to Spain. Why Spain? Because in the Roman Empire, the best silver and gold mines were being done and mined in Spain. And it was there that you could find perhaps a good community and perhaps a band of believers who were better off than others in the poorer countries of the middle of Europe. I want to note also here, he speaks that the epistle of Jude is indeed accepted by the Catholic Church, that is, the universal Christian church, not the Roman Catholic Church. The epistle of Jude is indeed accepted by the Catholic Church, as are the names of the two letters of John, and we receive his apocalypse, the revelation, and that letter of Peter. 
of which some refuse to have read, and there's a, a blurb in there. We think that has to refer to 2 Peter because 2 Peter and the book, the letter of Jude have almost exact contents, and there was an uncertainty whether somebody was trying to fake this. There were letters going out in the name of Paul that they declare in other uh, writings that they could tell right away Arian's heresy and trying to demote the divinity of Jesus was being passed on in these fake letters. So we have here the testimony that these people had the Bible we had, or at least what we are reading of what they had is one and the same passed down apostolically. We don't have to rely though always on others. Um, Eusebius in his church history writes this, just regarding the life of Peter and Paul. Nero was first heralded to be above all an antagonist of God. He stirred up murder in the hearts of people and against the apostles. It is related that in his day, Paul was beheaded at Rome itself and that Peter was likewise crucified and this story is accredited by the attachment which prevails today of the names of Peter and Paul on the cemeteries there. What he's saying is going to Rome and there's a St. Peter and a St. Paul cemetery there where each of the apostles was buried. Uh, some will say, well, St. Peter's cemetery got the Vatican built over it. The, but we don't know that for sure. But at that particular point, both men died, and it's pretty much in Nero's time attributed to 66 AD. And we have someone else who is a Roman historian who says at the beginning, a violent persecution was made against Christians. No one must profess Christianity was the law published. Then Peter and Paul were condemned to death, the former beheaded, Peter was crucified. So these are not legends or made up stuff about the value of the scripture we have today, but rather a testimony. So I want you to be confident that as you're reading Peter, over time through all these, there's testimony. This is the legit stuff. This is the real deal. You are reading from one who walked with Jesus and the Holy Spirit is conveying the, what he wants you to know from that. We also have others. You don't have to just stick to Christian writers. There was Tacitus. Some of you know that if you've been historians. Tacitus, who's in the early time of Clement of Rome, 115. And there's also Pliny. His father was a historian, but Pliny the Younger was in these same days. The interesting thing was in 111, Pliny became the governor of Bithynia, and Bithynia is one of the places to which Peter is writing his letter to the exiles. So hopefully if that builds your confidence in what we're reading, the fact that it's not just Christian writers, but also secular writers who testify to the Christian faith to its being outlawed. Pliny writes a letter in 111 saying, I'm here in Bithynia, and the, okay, Christians are outlawed under a particular time of uh, Trajan, um, what do I do with these guys? They're, they're not harming anybody, and he, he is sort of at a, a loss as to, to why go after nice people who are great citizens, but because they're supposedly outlawed, you know, what do you want to do about this? So that's where he is in his writing. And now that takes us today to our lesson. And the first thing we want to look at is what Peter opens up with. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. If you have your map in front of you, it's a little hard to see, but I have dark outlined here what is today the country of Turkey. And you can see within the borders that I have scrawled here, Bithynia, Cappadocia, Asia, not the Asia like we know of the Far Orient, the Asia of Turkey. 
You'll see that Tarsus is there. So Paul, St. Paul, was originally a born Jewish Turk. And he was born a free citizen, which became a real embarrassment later on to summon the Roman army who bought their citizenship and were about to punish him without a trial. As you see this and see the way Cappadocia and all these are lying out, I want to point out that from southwest and northeast, if you look at a topographical map of Turkey, or you go and look at some pictures of even today's Turkey, you will see long, high-range mountains. Kind of remind me of the Sierra Nevadas out there in Southern California, the way they rise up in the background. And in each of these valleys, the Christians fled. We believe probably this time, although it could have been under the time when Paul as Saul of Tarsus was persecuting the church. That was way back in 34. Peter's writing around 62 or 63, and there have been little outbursts by Caligula, and now is the time of Nero when little outbursts are going before he goes full-scale nuts in 64 AD. <clears throat> That's the technical term. He went nuts. You know, he was in insane. So as you see this, one of the hardships about getting this, notice it doesn't say to the church in within your capital, it says to the believers, you guys are all scattered. I know you're finding one another in some way or other. You know who's who as a Christian, as it is in China today when it's outlawed to gather, but people still find their ways to do it. So you are here. <laughs> we are, we're, we're going to study Turkey here today. Uh, but this map is to help you see the extent of the Roman Empire. Hadrian's Wall was built, if you see up where Great Britain is, you'll see at the top of Britain where York, and then the land comes in close before the Scottish border. Hadrian's Wall is across that little inlet. It, if you want to do it on your bucket list, go ahead. It takes six days to walk it tells you what a great architectural structure, as we mentioned last week, in terms of arch and vault, of the building of aqueducts and bridges, but also firm stone walls. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who were exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit for the obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. This is a reason for us to pull up our little sheets here. You have one that has all these blanks. And let's start with some of the key words. I, I couldn't help feeling that we, we needed to look at key words in Peter in order uh, to get the excitement. I'm sure you probably did during your week of reading and saying, wow, this is great. So let's see what we can learn out of this. For those of you who are watching right now, streaming in, as I noticed last week, you can see the bald spot in the back of my head. I'm thinking of putting a happy face in there so you'll feel better about it. First of all, here's one of the key words, apostle, A-P-O-S-T-L-E, which means somebody who is sent to carry out a duty. Jesus said, go into all the world, and publicly proclaim the good news that I'm the Messiah and that our kingdom is coming. And he who turns to me in repentance and faith, who listens to what God says about the nature of our hearts and the need to be cleansed from our sins. A sin is an unfelt thing at times for people, but wrong, the sense of wrong, is always in people. The book of Romans reminds us God has put into us a conscience that now accuses and said, yeah, you're really wrong. And other times excuses saying, oh, that, you know, well, look at everybody else. They're worse than I am. No. The fact is, the apostle is sent 
to carry out a duty. And that's why Peter puts this here. I'm, I'm giving you a duty. I'm not just here sitting around the matzo barrel or the cracker barrel and reminiscing on my past. I'm here to tell you something because Jesus told me to do it. We also have to the exiles. An exile is someone... Um, oh, I'm sorry. We should do elect first. It's the elect. To the elect... The elect people. An elect person is chosen for a purpose. When a guy's on a ballot and he's elected, what's he chosen for? Dog catcher, mayor, governor, who knows what. But you get your name on the ballot so that you might be elected or chosen for a purpose. And that, in this case, is to govern somebody or represent somebody well. And then you have exiles. An exile is a stranger in another land. I'll say stranger somewhere else. But he's always thinking about home. I was born in the city of Lancaster down on President Avenue. They still don't have a plaque on 826. That little house still nothing. <laughs> when I was out in seminary in California, I used to talk always about this, and people say, oh, isn't that where the Amish are, and what about them? And, so they would get reams of Amish and Mennonite history along with also the settling of Presbyterians here. They always thought it was a great idea that William Penn let Presbyterians in this area. And if you know you go across Route 372 in our county, you'll see Middle Octorera and Old Union Church and a whole bunch that come off of 372. Why was that? Because Lord Calvert's colony, the Roman Catholics, were bumped right up against Pennsylvania. And until Mason and Dixon got the line, it was a shifting line and an embarrassment to both states and to people who lived there. You'd get the Maryland tax collector coming to you and you'd say, I'm in Pennsylvania. <laughs> you'd get the Pennsylvania tax collector coming and you'd say, no, I'm in Maryland. And you tried to shift that way. William Penn, who was a pacifist and a Quaker, thought, well, who are the people who are going to resist the Catholic intrusion? The Presbyterians. Go put them on there. So that's why in our county you'll see where Presbyterians settled had to do with facing the southern border and protecting Penn's woods. Weren't we noble? Okay. We have exiles, and an exile is always thinking about somebody at home. And I remember in seminary, a guy saying to me, Frank, you love this Lancaster. You ought to be a tour guide for that. And I said, well, it's great. So I want to say it's with real heartache for me that I have lived in Lancaster County my last 30 years here, and I have watched the effacing and almost total disappearance of what made Lancaster Lancaster. It's Pennsylvania Dutchness. Now we're all homogenized like the long neon strip of strip malls, and we're all Americans that don't have any particular taste. But if you go to a restaurant and the gal says, what for pie do you want? You'll understand the Germans, when they want to say what kind of, say was für, which literally translates in English to what for. So what for dessert do you want is saying, what kind of dessert do you want? Or what for pie is asking, what kind of pie do you want? Every once in a while, you'll see an editorial to Jack uh, the Scribbler saying, what's this thing with, with waitresses is, do you want coffee a while? Well, that's just the little Germanic thing about in the interim till I can bring the pie or the cake, what do you want? Do you want coffee? Do you want coffee a while? What's this a while? And it's sad that the answers that come up are kind of obscure because they don't relate to the German language and Pennsylvania Dutchness of our county. I'll probably be one of the last guys eating Ludna bologna and Utz potato chips. It's Utz, not Utz. They love it when I call them and the lady will say, is this Utz? Uh, this is Utz. And I'll say, what happened to Utz's? You know, yeah, because in the European language, A is not A like in English. American, it's ah, and the e is a sound, and an i is e sound. But anyway, 
that's just a reminder. We're, we've lost the culture that is what an exile would think about when he's away. I want to get back home to where the real good stuff is. And there's some of you probably from the South who, if you're from North Carolina, you know the best pork barbecues in the world are there. You want to get back there. And for others of you who want to go back to Arizona or to Florida to work on your tan, but mainly just to keep warm because circulation gets thin when you're old, Okay, you know, we all have favorite places. An exile, unlike a sojourner, you know, sojourner comes up. That means somebody who has immigrated, emigrated to some other place where he's planning on staying or living, or maybe he'll stay for an indefinite period of time. That's a sojourner, a temporary dweller. But an exile is somebody on the move longing to get back to home. Now we have another great word, dispersion. Diaspora was used in a lot of old Bible translations. A dispersion means exactly what it is. You're dispersed. You're shipped out and sent around. You're scattered because of some kind of problem. And the dispersion in this case is to all those who are hiding up in the mountain ranges and small villages of Turkey, although that was no country then, Bithynia, Cappadocia, and so on. It's interesting that Peter writes to people in Bithynia, as we mentioned, Pliny the Younger got to be governor in 111, didn't know what to do with Christians. Paul, when he was doing his second missionary journey and wanted to go to Bithynia, was forbidden by the Holy Spirit, says the book of Acts, from going there. Probably because of feudal tribes, and he might have had a, what we would have called a premature death before his time, and so he was forbidden to go there, and he went on the outskirts of Asia, that is the northern border around, till he went down to Corinth. So as you're reading, hopefully this will come alive. Keep your map with you when you're reading, because when you see where they're going, it makes it clearer what the Lord's doing. Now, as we read in verse 2, again, this is all according to the foreknowledge of God. The F is for foreknowledge. And the Greek word for this is, I'm going to put it in English, prognosis. What is a prognosis? How is it different from a diagnosis? A diagnosis analyzes a problem. But a prognosis knows possible outcomes of the situation. So you have a circumstance where God, it says, knows the facts beforehand. And if we talk about God's foreknowledge, the Christian who comes to saving grace and recognizes that God opened his or her heart to say yes to Jesus and to repent of sin and to seek to follow Christ knows that there's no good reason in the whole world now, every once in a while, somebody that's worse than we are goes across our path, and we get the feeling, <clears throat> well, maybe I deserved it a little bit. And then God makes us have to repent of that false humility. But the person who is outside of Christ doesn't understand why this is a big deal. I don't want to be going around all the rest of my life saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to God. I just want to live my life and be happy. God's foreknowledge is not knowing whether somebody would accept him or not because God knew already that none of us would accept the Lord. We would always, some way, somehow in our lifetime, break the law of God, dishonor him. I mean, we do it daily anyway. In a country where we have grown up with only presidents, we have no idea what it is to serve a king. So that when the king says, thus do, and you know it's unjust but unright, you say, yes, your majesty, and maybe you say under your breath, you jerk, but the fact is, we don't know what it is to bend the knee. We think of God as a president, a guy we can negotiate with, somebody that's bigger and more powerful than we, but he, he's open to reason, you know, to, to deal with us on our terms. No. God's foreknowledge is that nobody would be saved but in God's foreknowledge, he chose who he would save. 
Through the sanctification, look at this, I love this, and we heard Pastor Walker say this this morning, in the sanctification of the Spirit. Does this mean we are purely holy and sinless? No. To be sanctified, sanctification is the act of setting apart. You shall be holy as I am holy. Holy has moral purity in it, but, and that's usually what we think. Oh, how can I ever be holy because I'm not pure of motive? I'm not pure of heart. But the base of the word holy means different. I am holy. I am so different from all the deities that people carve or think about or give a name to. We know in the Psalms, there are two Psalms. 115 is one of them that says... People have gods, but they have ears that don't hear. They have noses, but they can't smell. They have eyes that don't see. They have heads without brains that cannot lead you. But the living deity, Jehovah, the ever-being one is what his name means. Ever there, always there. He has talked to you. He's talked to Moses in Hebrew. Imagine that. He talked to Paul in Greek. My goodness, it's astonishing. The God who has made people has said, be different than I am. Oh, that looks, I knew that looked incomplete. Setting apart. Now, in Lancaster County, the Mennonites and those of you from plain background know that part of the way you set yourselves apart, or our ancestors did, was by sticking to the old clothing of the Swiss valleys and letting people know because we came from Switzerland and we came as seekers of the truth to baptize again. That's why we stay as we stay. But the fact of being set apart and being different is to be as different a human being as God is a deity of other gods. God doesn't go for fertility cults and sexual looseness. Why? Because purity of heart is what our God is like, and that is what he wants to begin to put in us. If you don't like purity of heart, don't expect to go to heaven because that's all there is to looking at people and honoring one another and being glad for them all your day. Exactly what the scripture says. When one member suffers, we all suffer. If one is honored, we all ought to say, yay, instead of, well, how come they got it, you know? <clears throat> we are to be as different a human being. Now, our neighbors get this all the time. My wife does many kindly things for folks in our neighborhood. We're on a uh, retirement row of cottages, Smurf houses. <laughs> and we do kindly things. And they say, oh, what do you, you know, you do? It's so wonderful. It's like, come on. And I have to fight a particular neighbor that we had for 30 years in town who every time we would invite them to dinner just so they would have, we would rind them so you don't have to do pots and pans, you can just relax tonight and be with each other. Okay, we have to have you back. Do you have people like that? They'll send you a thank you note thanking you for thanking them and then you thank them for thanking you for the, and on and on it goes. There are people that always feel they have to pay back. And those are people who are really stuck if they are seeking to follow Christ because they'll always feel they owe Jesus something. He has told us what it is, but we don't want to hear that. We want to do something we can do. Okay, notice that this setting apart is for what purpose? Why does God want us to be different than other human beings? Why does he want us to be this way? He says for obedience to Jesus. For the obedience to Jesus Christ. This is fabulous. God didn't save me in order to prove I can be sinless or that I'll be morally okay all the time. What did God do? God set me apart that I would obey Jesus and begin to become like he is in this great. All right, so, for the obedience notice to Jesus Christ. That's what the text says. We're not being obedient to some universal law. Notice we're... This is the key of Christianity. We are not related to a body of principles like a religion. We are committed to a human being who has been raised from the dead, alive, 
Though we do not see him at the moment, he is there and he is coming again. Here we have obedience to Jesus Christ. And for what reason, as this purpose gives us, it's actually by the, the means of the sprinkling of blood. Sprinkling with blood. In the Old Testament, especially in Exodus 24, Moses is told that gather the people together, says God, and I'm going to make an agreement with them. Now you all hear about the covenant, the old covenant and the new covenant. What was the old covenant? I will be your God and you will be my people. Of all the races of the earth, you were the least of them all. There was nothing about you that was desirous, but I have chosen you. I'm putting my heart on you and I'm going to love you. And because I'm a faithful God, every time you break your part of the bargain and I am justified in destroying you, I'll keep my end of the bargain anyway. I will still be your God if you want me for your God. And then Moses was to ratify it by slitting the throat of an unblemished lamb, putting the blood in a basin, dipping the hyssop in and sprinkling the people and sprinkling the word, the Ten Commandments at one point and another time a written decree, I'll be your God, you'll be my people. The sprinkling of blood was there. For those of you who remember Dr. Reem's class last year in Leviticus, you remember what he said? The sacrificial system was a continuous, constant cutting and slitting of throats of bulls and rams with you could hear the moans and the groans of the executions and blood everywhere, all over the priest. It was splattered against the altar. It was sprinkled on the people. It was done on the tabernacle. It was to remind you that sin is a bloody mess. And if Jesus had not given himself for us, we would still be part of that sacrificial bloody mess that cannot cannot cleanse us from sin because our records still before God are full of great misdeeds and sins. Astonishing. And that's why we get to verse 3 and it said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy. Now listen carefully, everybody. Mercy means holding back what you deserve. In the Old Testament, even though it's been falsely translated, chesed, which means faithfulness, God's faithfulness, to always keep his end of the bargain, even when he doesn't have to. Chesed, faithfulness, it says his faithfulness endures forever. But we translate that as love. Does the love of God endure forever? For some it won't. But why do we say the mercy of the Lord is forever? The mercy of the Lord is forever. Because at any moment, if God pulled back what we deserved, what would happen to us? We would utterly perish. So that all the years that we are in heaven and forevermore with the Lord and cleansed, with a new nature and the work of the Spirit and our Savior and our presence. Had any time God said, I'm not going to be merciful anymore, we would be dropped. But it will not happen because that's his promise that he whom is elect in him will indeed live forever with him. This mercy is a reminder I, the, the movie Robin Hood that Kevin Costner was in, I remember being struck when Morgan Freeman comes up with this great stentorian tone and he's the, <clears throat> you know, the uh, Muslim and he said, Allah is merciful. And the way he said it on the screen at the moment, at a time when they were looking for reprieve, I thought, you know, Allah is merciful. That's what a Muslim says. But he started saying it 600 years after Jesus was there, speaking of a merciful father. And he was saying it 2,000 plus years after Moses heard Jehovah, Jehovah, the great and awesome God, 
showing mercy to thousands. This is great. Mercy belongs to Jehovah. And I think this is one of the reasons that for our Muslim friends, even though they say, well, all is the same. No, it isn't. God's given us his name. It's Yahweh, Jehovah, the ever-being one. Allah just means the great or high one. Jehovah, ever-being, is encompasses eternity and beyond, as we know time and space. Wonderful. This God, sprinkled with the blood of Jesus and getting his mercy, have been born again. A phrase that evangelicals used way back in the 1970s when Chuck Colson became a Christian. This was his book, and people wanted to know, what is this phenomenon? President Jimmy Carter said, I, I don't have any trouble with it. I'm born again. And it's, what? We have a president. It's, what? <laughs> and it means rebirth. God has given us rebirth. Anaganato. You know, your genealogy or your, your genus. You're, you're born again. And born again unto a living hope. Now, Pastor Walker spoke of this this morning. I want to be a little more sharp about what the, the word means. The word hope. As he pointed out, a guy said, hey, did you get an A on that test? Well, I hope so. How'd your job interview go? Do you think you got the position? Well, I hope so. We use hope in the words like a 50-50 shot with fate hopefully ruling in our favor. But hope in the New Testament Greek means certain expectation. Certain expectation. So what does Hebrews chapter 11 say? What is faith? Faith is the substance, the essence, the stuff, so to speak, of what makes up faith because it is the substance of things hoped for and the conviction of things you don't see. Now, for a Christian, this can be a a real problem on time to time. The tempter comes and we're alone. Other people throw it up in our face. Aren't you just playing some mind game, Frank? Wishing that this is the way it would really be? And it's easy to get unbuckled from that unless you say, well, no, because my certain expectation, Jesus said he's coming again, so he's coming again. MacArthur told people in 1944 when driven out of the Philippines, I shall return. And they printed it on matchbook covers and they put it on pamphlets and dropped it from planes. And the guys that were on the baton death march just saw this. I shall return. And when he did, 1945, the world was over in eight months. That's who we face. <laughs> so the fact is we expect Jesus because he said he would come. We expect Jesus because we have witnesses in the New Testament who saw him alive from the dead and which we'll hear more from Peter about this. And the whole point is that we are not playing a mind game because we thought it up. We were told about this. We know who has said it. We know the reliable witnesses. And so we're going to say, even though it looks like 2,000 years have gone, and God's not doing anything. And look how smart we are today in our technology. Everything we used to have to have massive warehouses I hold in the palm of my hand with a smartphone. Even though I don't. I'm one of the last 28 guys in Lancaster County to have a landline. But as it is, here we are, not playing the mind game, but accepting the promise. We are sure this is going to be. Why? Because he said so, and he's deity. He's God himself. He's not going to let us down according to the whole performance that even though you break your part of the bargain, Frank, I will be your God. I want you to be my people. Be my people. Be different. Be set apart. Be a human being that people look at and say, why do you do this? Why do you sacrifice yourself? Why do you give this up? Why do you put all this money? My son one time asked us when we were in our church out in Michigan. He was a young boy, and he had friends who every two or three years, the father got a new car. And he said one day, Dad, you know, Gene and his family got another new car. How come we don't get a new car? And I said, Son, you and I 
take our money, and we believe that we should give at least the first tenth and even more that we have to the work of Jesus Christ and to those who go to tell his good news in the world. So when that money goes there, it's not there for a car. Now Ajit and his father, they don't use their money this way. They just have a lot of it so they can go buy another car. That was one of the happiest days of my life because my son said, okay. He accepted it for the, what it was and I thought, this is terrific. And, and I was never questioned again about it as a father, why we didn't buy something new. And it's not because I'm cheap. It's, <clears throat> I'll be economical, right? <laughs> okay. We are born again to a living hope. Now, why are we having this living hope? Because it's through what? The resurrection. If Jesus weren't alive from the dead, everything we deal with every Sunday might as well just be something like going to a Rotary Club or a Kiwanis meeting. If this is not based on the fact that one who said, I am coming back, after you see me, you will have great joy. I have to leave you again. You're going to be a little sad about that, but you ought to be glad because I'm going to send my spirit because the spirit is without body and form. Remember, as we said, the Son of God took on human body flesh and to this day at the right hand of the Father is in a resurrection body that is recognizable whereas the nature of the deity and the spirit of the deity can be many places and many hearts around the world at once. After all, we see in the Psalms that God opens his hand and feeds the desire of every living thing, Psalm 145. When you and I sit down and say, thank you, Lord, for this meal today, do we think about, you know what, this guy over in India is getting fed today, and the guy in Korea, and, and all these people in Japan are, God said he's keeping track of every Christian that's somewhere else in the world is saying, you're taking care of me today. What a great God we have doing that. This resurrection from the dead is not resuscitation. There were those who used to question the resurrection of Jesus. I love the word in Greek, what it is. You want to know what the word of resurrection is in Greek? Anastasis. And that's why I like girls with the name Anastasia. It means raised up to stand again, a living being. Anastasia is a great name for a girl if you're a Christian, I suppose, because you can say it's a reminder to her that her name represents Jesus Christ and who he is to us today. The resurrection is not resuscitation. The, the swoon theory was in the Middle East for a long time, saying that Jesus only fainted. They put him in the cool of a tomb and he revived after several days. Sort of like wakes in our time. I grew up in Pittsburgh after my father moved into corporation law and left Duke Street. And the interesting thing was, we were in a house on a corner that was five blocks deep of Roman and Irish Catholics, and Ro Roman Catholics who were Irish and Italian. And whenever the Irish had a death, it would say in the paper there'd be a wake held. And I used to think like, wait, well, the guy's not going to wake, he's dead, you know, and I couldn't figure this out. The way, you know from probably history that many people, this is especially prevalent in Ireland and in Greece, that a lot of people breathe very shallowly and they actually pass out. And because mirrors weren't there before that you'd stick under their nose, you'd poke or push this, there was no response. But it was found out that sometimes their pulse and their whole circulation had slowed down to a place that eventually they would wake up again. And so if this person were declared dead, you would have the wake and he would sit there and you would wait for three days before the funeral in case he would wake up. And if he didn't, then he goes in the ground. And in Greek history, in some of the stories, people actually were buried alive even after the third day. And it was only found out later when digging family plots, they would see coffins or things were evidence of internal attempt to get out. It was in the wooden box. In the American colonies, 
a, a practice by the British was after you would have the three days, you would put the person in the coffin, but you would tie a small rope around the wrist and drill a hole through the coffin and bring it out, and it would be placed on top of a bell that was at the grave. And so after you had the service and buried him, once in a while, the groundskeeper would hear a dinging. The person waking up was moving, and this rope was ringing the bell, and that's where we got the famous saying, he was saved by the bell, because they would be dug up again and brought back to life. Yet it had nothing to do with boxing or going down for the count before the referee <laughs> heard the bell stopped around. You were saved by the bell, and in some sense, you and I can think about in Jesus Christ, we were already dead, says Ephesians. We're going to get to that with Dr. Walker, Ephesians 2. You were dead in your sins, but you know what? You were saved by the Christ who rang the bell, not, not that we woke ourselves up. All right, well, you can see there's a lot here. I haven't even gotten to the whole of the chapter. So I want to say, as we get down here, you notice that we, again, are born again. What are we born again to? A living hope. What is the living expectation? That I will inherit eternal life by the resurrection of Jesus. And notice what it says about my inheritance. It's we are born unto an inheritance. And what's it say? It's imperishable, meaning can't be ravaged by an army. It is undefiled, meaning it's unpolluted and untainted. There's nothing corrupt of it. And it's unfading, meaning there's no decay or withering. Kept in heaven for you, a great military term meaning a set of guards like we read in Romans, uh, I mean Acts 12 where Peter's in prison and he's guarded or kept by a foursome of soldiers. As we see this, the point is you and I have an inheritance of an eternal life not because we're so good or not because we were saved by the bell or that we skimmed through some way but because Jesus Christ said, I'll be your God, you be my people, and I'm going to die for you. But because I'm the living God, I can't be kept dead, but in my human flesh I can pay the penalty for you. I have no guilt of my own, but I'll take yours. And Father will write across the ledgers of heaven in our book of the sins, P-A-I-D, in red letters of blood. And I can now be happy. If you are an inheritor, I loved it when the, you know, the rich young ruler came and said, Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What do you have to do to inherit something? You have to be named as one in the will, but what else? Somebody has to die before you get the prize, and Jesus Christ has died to give us this inheritance. Life everlasting. Our promise is that we will always be with the Deity who is, who is beyond time and eternity, who says, I dwell in the high and holy place, but also with him or her who is of a humble and contrite heart. Isaiah 15, 57. That's worth keeping in your mind. Now, it speaks about going on to trials. And unfortunately, Americans can't stand pain. They have an aspirin or something for every, every ache and groan. Not that I diminish that. But when it talks about though you're in suffering or trials for right now, the word trial here means training. It's like you and I after this year of the epidemic and the pandemic. Oh, I put on 10 pounds. Okay, we're going to go back to the gym and we're going to shake this off and we're going to get our stiff muscles moving. We're going to get our blood circulating again. And what do we feel right away? Oh. Uh, something pushing against it, a trial. The trial of athletic training is that it hurts you, but it doesn't hurt you to sap your strength. If you do the exercises, what eventually happens? You get stronger and take another capability. Okay, you're lifting 10 pound weights. Then you get on to 12, and on to 15, and on to 20. That's what training means here. When he is talking about the trials that you are facing, it's saying whatever is resistant in your life, whether it's a Neronian persecution or whether it's 
like the bad news we heard of our missionary mother who may be dying, although I told Dr. Walker that I will be praying that the God who turned the sundial back several degrees and the God who brought alive from the dead our Lord Jesus might give a stay of life to this sister in Christ. And maybe you can pray that along too. Um, even though we know what their prognosis, what's a prognosis? Unlike a diagnosis, which just analyzes it, the prognosis says, this is what you need to do to get it right, or this is the best thing to do in this condition, foreknowledge, knowing what this thing does. All right, now I put on the back, and for you who had your second half sheet that are streaming in, I tried to bring along because of all this. Look at this. We just dealt with a super vocabulary of 1 Peter 1. We'll get to more of the body of this to tie it into chapter 2 next week. But here you can see, again, the flow of thought that Paul has. The resurrection of Jesus guarantees personal assurance of having everlasting life. The resurrection of Jesus gives us a living hope. And what's my hope? That I'll inherit eternal life. I don't have to do anything. Somebody has to die to give it to me. And he has. Notice the living hope. You receive this by trusting the promise of Jesus. You keep it even when at times you think, or other people mock you, saying, why do you put up with all this misery, you know, for your so-called Christian faith? You'll keep it in the trials, and indeed, it'll be revealed at the judgment. This is what the Calvinists call the perseverance of the saints, or maybe better yet, the preservation of the saints by God to keep them keeping on. Even though at times you may say, if it weren't for God, or it weren't for the Bible, if it weren't for Jesus, I don't know why I'd even do this. But you do it because you know he has said. Also notice that the salvation that we're talking about, besides being this kind of solid inheritance, was told by prophets. Not only Old Testament, remember there were New Testament prophets like Agabus in the book of Acts. And they verified the word of God by proclaiming this publicly and it came to pass. And it was also verified by the Holy Spirit. How is that? It's sealed in our hearts, the fact that we, we trust this. We trust it. And I can't tell you why, but I know it's really true. Even though I cannot see the evidence, that's the certain hope I have. And so when we get down to verse 13, what is... What does he say? Gird up your loins. Gird up your loins. What does that mean? It means people used to have robes would take them and tuck them and stick them in here. But when you did that, your legs were showing and you, you looked ridiculous. But that was the way it was. So think about the prodigal son parable. The father sees his son who years ago said, old man, as far as you and I are concerned, I'm done with you. Give me my inheritance which was one-third of what the father's net wealth was. Okay, son, my, I'm, my, my estate's worth $60,000. Here's 20. Because the elder son always got a double portion. Fine. See and don't think about me. And off he goes to a far country and wastes it away. But when he came to his senses, he came and said, my father's servants have better than this. The pigs are eating better than I am in this country. I'm going to go home and say, sorry, Dad. I didn't mean it. <laughs> and it says, the father sitting on the front porch, he sees his son, and he girds up his lunch. Here's a man of dignity. Here's a man of an estate. Here's a man who's been growing wealth, and his older son is going to get far more than he ever did earlier. But it says he girds himself up to look ridiculous and runs down the path to hug his son. If you have doubts about whether you're good enough for God, you're not. I never was. None of us are. But the fact is, he searches us out. He finds us. And so, as a result of this, we're told, because God girded up his loins to come and find us, we're to prepare our mental, or our will. I'm going to will to do what God wants, difficult as this may be. Because when you say, gird up your mind, you have to say, you know, I'm going to will to do this, no matter what. 
holiness and being separate in behavior is not an easy task. Exercise self-control, says verse 13. Expect the return of Jesus, says verse 13. Live as a child of his kingdom, says verse 14. And in 15 and 16, be ye holy as I am holy. Be as different a person in the human race, not freakish, just be different as you are morally and in behavior as I am a God who is so different from all the fertility cult gods and all the helpless gods that can't do anything for people. Is this edifying? I hope so. Remember next week you have a verse from 1 Peter 2 as well as repeating your verse from 1 Peter 1. Join me as we pray. Heavenly Father, we hardly even remember how great is our inheritance or that what we were to have for eternal life was given by you to us, not that we earned or deserved. Blessed be the name of Jesus, who by his resurrection makes us glad and have great certain expectation that we will be with you forever because of his loving care, his sprinkling with blood, and his sending of your spirit. Thank you for encouraging us about the fidelity of your word. As we continue through Peter, help us with him to rejoice in you, our great God and King. It's through Jesus we come to you and thank you. Amen. So be it.